Um, so, uh, yeah, I sort of have this idea of the data delusion, because we don't have uh, lots of fast computers. We get to spend a lot more time thinking rather than computing. So uh, this is my thoughts. I do quite a lot. I've been interested in deep learning for a number of years, uh, sort of about 10 years, but different types of deep models than many of those we talked about. Uh, more recently, and all the successes we've heard, particularly with image processing. So one of the things that's happened recently is this AlphaGo result, um, and that got a lot of press. Um, and one of the really, I mean, I think it's a remarkable result. It's incredible work by an amazing team at DeepMind. But one of the things that wasn't highlighted so much was just how much data AlphaGo saw um, before it even took on the European champion in Go. Um, it's seen more games of Go than any human could ever possibly see in their lives. And even between the time that it beat Fan Hui and the time that it played against Lee Sedol, it played many, many more games. I don't know exactly how many, but I suspect between those, across those four or five months, it played more games of Go than any human could ever possibly see in their lives. Now, the amazing thing about that is Lee Sedol still beat it. And that is, uh, okay, it's a difficult challenge. It's also remarkable it took us 20 years to go from Go to chess. These are both, although it goes harder, they're both things that can be represented by game trees. Um, so in some sense, it's a little bit disappointing that we've taken so long. And I think that really what's going on is we have to be a bit cautious. There's a lot of things we can now solve, and we've heard about some of them. I thought Alex's example was a very nice, we've made a lot of progress with computer vision. But for a lot of areas in medicine, there's a real problem with a delusion about, um, well, what I call the data delusion. Um, a delusion about progress that is not being driven by any form of machine learning. And I assure you, I've been in the field for 20 years, and I can tell you that the techniques we've been mainly talking about were developed in this sort of time, in the early 1990s. But what this plot is showing you is what's happened across that period. So it's a plot from a, a nice paper by Hilbert and Lopez in Science. It, it goes back to 2011, but this plot only goes to 2007. It's an estimate of how much data there is in the world. Um, and of course, it starts analog. This is like when I was 13, watching videos of the police academy. Um, so this is 1993. Um, where we're starting to get digital data in. Now, what they said is the beginning of the digital age is the period at which the amount of digital data starts to overtake that of the analog data. And here we are today, you know, kids are uploading on mobile phones to Facebook more video every second than we had in the entire world back then. Now, these techniques that we're talking about, the ones that are primarily successful, backpropagation, convolution, neural networks, were invented here. Now, by this time, we'd realized they weren't working very well. We didn't reject them because there was a conspiracy against neural networks, whatever the narrative is saying at the moment. We rejected them because they did not work on low data. SVM, support vector machines, Gaussian processes, other methods performed better. The change which has occurred here, beyond this graph, which is mainly driven by the sort of a Sutskevier and the Hinton paper, is that we've got so much data now that we are actually able to fit these models. So ImageNet was 1.2 million data points. The sort of benchmarks we were looking at in this period here had about 60,000, the MNIST data. That was a very large data set for the time. It's still a benchmark used today, but then it was considered a very challenging data set. But on MNIST, what happened was people in about 1997 got better performance with support vector machines than you could get with convolutional neural networks. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the computational power. Computational power has gone up, and that was mentioned, and that is a big issue. But Data has rocketed. So you have to be really, really careful when you're thinking about your application in terms of how much data you have and whether these new techniques are appropriate for you. For many techniques, uh, for many data sets, they are. So I have a little uh, analogy to talk about that. This here is a picture of a steam engine that was invented in 1712 by a guy called Thomas Newcomen. So Thomas Newcomen lived in the southwest of England. Um, and he was interested in inventing steam engines because they had tin mines down there. And the tin mines were, had been mined since Roman times and were getting quite deep and the water was coming in. So this engine was invented to pump out those mines. That's what this is here. So it's a simple engine where there was a, there was a cylinder that was heated up by a boiler. And then once the uh, uh, steam uh, inflate, pushed the sort of piston up, then you would let cold water into the cylinder, which caused the steam to compress and the piston to come back down. It's called Newcomen's engine. Who's here has heard of Newcomen before? It's a technical audience, so some of you should have done. Isn't that terrible that only four of you, five of you have heard of Newcomen? 1712. It's the start of the Industrial Revolution. So it was a problem. 
because this is where Newcomen was. This is where I live in Sheffield, on a large coal field. The tin was located a long way away from the coal. So Newcomen's engine wasn't actually very successful in the southwest because it was incredibly inefficient. Because this process of heating up a cylinder and then cooling it down wasted an enormous amount of heat. So the amount of coal you needed, and remember at this time, this is before canals, so pack horses are required to carry coal around the country. Um, that's the situation, and basically the engine's successful up here, in Sheffield, to the east of Sheffield, Nottingham, areas where you had coal, and coal mines used it to pump things out. So I want you to think of that, and I want you to remember that this is the situation now. <laughs> These deep learning models are incredibly inefficient. Incredibly inefficient, way less efficient than human beings. The coal fields are Google, Facebook, and Amazon. They have the data. They can do what they like with the data. Why do you think they're so willing to release the models and share the source code? Because you can't do anything with it. You don't have the data. The data is where the value lies. It makes no difference to them that you can access. In fact, it's great for them because they can share the improvement of their models quicker to get more efficient engines that are only operating in these regions. That's the challenge for democratizing machine learning. OK, so this image is representing what we're talking about today, which is, I think, the most inspirational, most interesting challenge in learning today, health. This individual here, lying on the bed, is an extremely complex organism. We're talking about going from sort of a um, you know, molecular level, molecular biology, up through organs, all the way to the exhibited health at the top. And we don't understand any of it, really. We understand the smallest pieces of it. It's remarkable that any of our medicines work at all. We don't understand the mechanism of loads of our medicines. All we do is clinical trials. And we're trying to resolve this with data that is also extremely difficult to access, data that's personal to the patient, data that we can't just share freely on the web. Um, so Compared to things like the visual system that we've solved so far, it's a lot more complex system and there's a lot less data. So I think when we're thinking about health, we have to be really careful not to get carried away too much by these recent successes. In imaging, fantastic. They're going to be a great help. We know that some of the ideas transfer. But for a lot of the things we really care about, also Brendan's, I didn't see Brendan's talk this morning because I was traveling down, but I've seen Brendan talk before. You know, we are getting data in these regions. There are exceptions for sure, but be careful because uh, there's a lot of areas where we're not getting such data. So this isn't actually, this is the best picture I could come up. It's not actually James Watt's engines. It's a similar engine. But of course, who here has heard of James Watt? Yeah. Why have you heard of James Watt? He did not invent the steam engine. He invented the efficient steam engine. He invented the separate condenser. The separate condenser allowed the steam engine to be used across the country. And that's what democratizing machine learning is about. It's trying to get it to the state where we can do artificial intelligence on the amount of data that humans can do. That's a massive challenge. We are nowhere near doing that at the sort of scales, certainly at the learning scales that we want to do over millions of data, billions of data, so on and so forth. So um, how am I doing on time? Oh, oh. there we go, good. OK, so this is uh, the deep face model. This is a model that was, uh, or as I like to call it, a Callista Flockhart detector. Um, it's uh, a model that was trained on a billion faces. How many of us here have seen a billion faces in our lives? That's like a seventh of the world. Um, <laughs> Uh, to, in order to detect whether someone, whether two images of the, same, of the face are the same or not. So I just want to really review a little bit about what's going on in these sort of models to try and give an impression. I don't like this idea it's a black box. It is not a black box, it's something that we can all understand and it's relatively simple. It's complex to implement, but it's relatively simple. What's going on is Callista's face is being transformed into through RGB images that have been turned around and it's being mapped by a series of functions to some different representations. Each of these functions is being illustrated very nicely in this paper by Facebook um, until you get to the end where you get a result, a label, yes or no, right? Now, composing these functions together is the big idea of deep learning, and it's cute. It's an old idea because it's coming from uh, uh, what we heard earlier in terms of uh, uh, 1993, back then, um, and it's one of the core ideas of the connectionist community that developed this. It's a cute idea. These functions are relatively simple, but the end result is very complex. And then the other idea, the sort of 86 back propagation idea, is if you can differentiate these functions, you can minimize an error. The problem is that these functions are also sort of incredibly complicated. So one way of thinking about what this machine is doing is it's a little bit like one of these pachinko machines. So Callista Flockhart's head is going in the top here, but instead of a multi-dimensional image, it's just a one-dimensional thing that's dropping in the top. 
and then it's going through these layers of pins that operate like the functions to move it around until it pops out the bottom into one bin or another that says what label it is. Now, each of those functions itself is a high dimensional object. So here, this is a one dimensional space. So this is like pachinko in many, many dimensions. Thousands of dimensions people like to use. They increase the dimensionality to increase the complexity. So that this is a sort of a, what the type of functions that are used. So phi was normally a rectified linear unit or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it used to be sigmoids or hyperbolic tangents or whatever else. It's a nonlinearity on a weighted linear sum. Now, I'd actually like to write this like this. So this is a matrix re-representation. But the key point here is this W matrix, which is the parameters, the locations of the pins, is in this size, that K8 by K9, where K8 is the size of one hidden layer, K9 the size of the next hidden layer. So those are typically in the thousands, so you're talking millions of parameters. So Deep Face has 153 million parameters, which is why you need a billion data points to work out where all those pin positions are. So this is what's going on in my little uh, PowerPoint animation. You get a data point. Is it Callista Flockhart? Uh, yes, you drop it through the machine. This is a, oh, not moving forward, there we go. Ah, but the model says no. So there's something wrong, we need to move the pins around. So this is before training, this is at initialization. Oh, and the no one, the one that was not Callista, ended up in the yes. So we have to fix that. So how do we fix that? Well, we move the pins around. We do our optimization to move the pins into the right position. Of course, Callista's face is very, very high dimensional. So this is happening in a high dimensional space. And then we drop the ball in through. Oh, great, yes. The blue is now correct. The no is now correct. And that one's correct. So why is this a very, very bad idea? Because that's correct for the three training data points we've had before but we can't tell anything about what small variations on those data points are gonna do. So in order to explore this entire space, you now need to shove a bucket load of balls through the pachinko machine to make sure it's getting everything right. And if you're doing a pachinko game in thousands and thousands of dimensions, you need even more buckets of balls. That's a major problem. Fortunately, we know what the solution is. The solution is very simple. Instead of considering one path through the pachinko machine, what we do is we look at multiple paths. We consider that the ball might be under small variations go through in different ways. So this is sort of like, it's a little bit like, I said this and it turned out there was a Nobel Prize winning physical, theoretical physicist in the audience. So if there's a Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist in the audience, don't take this too literally. It's a little bit like Feynman's quantum interpretation, uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. Um, his question afterwards was, do we need to solve quantum mechanics to solve machine learning? And I was like, uh, um, okay, so it's an analogy. It's a multi-path. It's the idea that things can take multiple ways through to get to the same thing, and you should explore all those, uh, those paths. The problem with that analogy is instead of just requiring the gradient of the model, we now need a convolution of this function, g of x, which represents our whole deep learning function, the composition of the individual functions. We need a composition of the whole thing. We need to take an integral. And anyone who does calculus should know that integrals are way, way harder than... Uh, taking the gradients. Differentiation is much easier than uh, an integral. So the solution of R, we can turn things into gradients is uh, sort of great, but it's not going to save us. It's not going to get us around this data delusion. There's a lot more work to do. Indeed, it's the work that people did in the 20 years following um, the initial invention of these models, and people are working on this. Don't, don't worry whether they'll get the models out there in time before all the hypes died down and everyone says these models don't work is another question. Um, but people are looking at it. So one of these models is a Gaussian process. This is the sort of thing I'm trying to use as these functions instead of neural networks. Gaussian processes work like this. this they, they allow, they're a way of generating many, 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 many functions. And then you look at your data and you throw away all the functions that don't fit your data. It's a really nice trick. Uh, it's very computationally expensive to do this because the process describes how the function should be created. You simulate a bunch of functions only with two data points, I've sampled like 100 here and then like 10 fit. So you have to do a lot of sampling. Fortunately, with Gaussian processes, you can do it analytically. It's actually that integral turns out to be analytical. So what we're trying to do here is, given our data, look at all the possible ways things could go between two data points. And that's the solution to this sort of uh, data delusion. So we've got papers on this um, going back a while now which are all part of this wider picture that I think is so I call this deep health I think before people got excited about deep stuff probably that's a company now so probably I can't say that anymore um, 
But the idea with deep health was that what we want to do is we want to build these functions up to try and relate all aspects of the human. So we've got clinical tests, we've got the treatment we may have applied, we've got their genotype, their environmental things, we may have some of them, uh, epigenotype, um, we've got biopsies, x-rays, uh, I've, sorry, I've lost these things here, that was like social networks, music listening habits. If you could look at every aspect of a human being, that's, what does that allow you to infer about their state of health? Um, the problem is this is a massively complex system and the data is very scarce and widely distributed. There's also this one issue that I call massively missing data, right? So people tend to think of, oh, it's a missing data problem. So we have the input to the neural network, there's 25 things needed. If any of them aren't there, that's a problem. Well, that's not the way we work at all, humans. What we would like to know about, what I'd like to know about any of you, but what do I know about you at the moment? You came to a deep learning summit. That's about all I know, and that you're mostly human beings, and so on and so forth. Um, that is, what could I know about you? I could know, like, so many more things about you. You are all rich, complex, wonderful, delightful people, and I don't know about any of that. So most of the time, I know nothing. Yet most of our paradigms assume you know everything, or maybe you've lost 10%. So dealing with those sort of uncertainties is a major challenge in these models. Um, and, and probability, uh, using these sort of uh, um, probabilistic approaches is the way to do it. So this is sort of what we'd like to do. We, we sort of had some of these methods worked out a few uh, years ago, and we've not made as much progress on scaling them up to very, very large data as I would have liked. I thought we'd do that quicker. So we've actually, um, we've launched a, a company that's gonna do that um, and be brilliant and worth millions and millions of pounds like everyone else's company. Um, Mainly because, actually, as I think I was talking to Brendan about it as well, it's very difficult when you've realized how to solve something to scale up your funding quick enough to deliver on the solution. You can't do it through research council funding because they won't back you. Right at this moment, we tend to get backing from uh, venture capitalists before we get banking from our research councils. So it's a sensible way to go. So I believe in this, so we've launched a company to do that. But that's not the whole story. And the last thing I want to end on is another thought that I'm not going to explore quite as much. This is the railway situation in 1840. So things have improved a little bit. Notice here down in London, you mostly have tracks going to Brighton for your holidays, Dover to go to France or Southampton to head off to the other side of the world. Whereas the rest of us have tracks going between coal fields for doing actual real work um, and, and delivering delivering coal down to uh, uh, um, Cornwall. So Sheffield's about bang on there. Actually, by 1850, there were loads, and the network of tracks in the north is massive. Nowadays, it's all centered around London. The network here by 1850 was enormous. Um, now, why is that? Because you had to deliver coal around the place, coal and other goods. And that is the other major problem we're facing now, accessibility of data. And it's because we're going about everything the wrong way. We need a better data infrastructure. And this is what's going on. And machine learning is at the heart of this problem now. In theory, it is possible to distribute your data all over the world in the cloud, on your phones, wherever you like. So this picture of data being in a centralized location is an old picture. It's the picture that I was brought up upon but it's not the situation today. Yet the machine learning algorithms we've developed only work on one large collected set of data. That's a real, real problem. So for the community that I work in, and no one's even looking at it, we are now becoming the problem that we are delivering a set of algorithms, including deep learning, that only work if you've collected all your data into a large coal field and are now going to examine it. We need to change that we need to have models where the data is outside, it's with the user, it's within their control. They control when it goes into the inner ring where it's going to be analyzed. They can withdraw that sort of permission so that they have the sort of trust that means that they're willing to give up medical data without fearing they've given away their lives to an insurance company, which is what happened with Care.Data, which was an appalling fiasco. We need to fix that very soon or we're not gonna make much progress with health. There was a great talk by Peter Diggle, I've just put it online actually, um, if you check my webpage, I think you'll find it somewhere, uh, where he was talking about epidemiology across the country and he showed how easy it is to find out where the cat and dog diseases instantaneously are across the country because cats and dogs don't worry about their privacy. You can't find that out. You can't find that out for humans. So the idea we've been working on with another couple of companies I'll mention in a moment is the idea of a data trust, a sort of trust that determines how the data is being shared. We don't know the best way of doing that, um, but then developing algorithms that can work within that trust. There's things called differential privacy that protect the privacy of the individual, collating this information in such a way that people trust you. Because in health, this is so vital. Unless we get this right, we're not gonna solve things. 
So that Citizen Me is the company that set that up, and Citizen Trust is the name of the trust they've set up to handle this bit inside. So Citizen Me is going to operate uh, inside this space. But according to the rules of the trust that people sign up to about how their data is shared, the ability to delete data, these sort of things are vital. OK, that's all I had to say um, apart from questions. Uh, you can find my web page here. I'm also on Twitter. I write blog posts about some of these ideas. And uh, I also write technical papers, too, if you want to read those. Thank you.